Beyond Bitcoin Hangouts are meant to give everyone a voice, a chance to speak with others who are passionate advocates for expanding the blockchain's use cases out into the world and beyond. Do you have a crypto community you would like to represent and hold open hangouts for? If so, you might find yourself on the path to owning a stake in Beyond Bitcoin. We are looking for people who care about people, people who want to bring others together, because crypto communities are people. Beyond Bitcoin is a movement of thinkers and doers in the crypto space. And if you feel you are one of them, reach out to beyondbitcoin at gmail.com for more information on how to debut your community's efforts to reach to the stars and beyond. Welcome everybody to another Beyond Bitcoin Hangout. Today is Friday, September 30th, 2016. And this episode is number 175. So for those of you who have been listening to all of these episodes, you have been here for every step of the way. You have been here for quite a bit of history that has led us to something called Steemit, built upon BitShares the code that was used for the decentralized flagship DAC known as BitShares that I call a meta exchange, a, a true meta exchange at this point in time with goals to eventually become a decentralized exchange truly. Um, so we've gotten to the point where we have accomplished a lot of stuff and we now have a platform called Steemit where we can fund the efforts of individuals who we believe in and we can utilize the power of our networks to get backing and that is actually what our hangouts here do uh, for the longest time we were not able to really get a whole lot of funding for these hangouts but you have all been here despite that uh, for a long period of time before that, you've been helping out with this. So I want to just, uh, first off, appreciate all of you guys for that. And I also want to say that now, this network, if you are all on Steam, you can support our Hangouts by upvoting them. Giving maximum voting power helps us to take the funds and build more things for us to be able to amplify the power of our community. So I want to re just remind everybody that to go out of your way to uh, help in various little ways with Beyond Bitcoin is going to be helping all of your projects. Um, and if anybody wants to look at the past, they can see that that is in fact pretty much the case if, if they pay attention to it. Uh, now with that said, it works the same way for all of you, right? If you have a lot of people who really support what you're doing and trust what you work on and the, pr the previous things that you've done, you can leverage them to get more coverage on our Hangouts or earlier coverage in our Hangouts. And because of that, uh, we have some teams that are shining on that and they're reaching out to different people and they're, they're networking and asking others to upvote their content. Now, some people might feel like it's difficult to get uh, to the top, but I will remind you that even if you do not get coverage in these hangouts, 24 seven, we have a mumble server that is available for free for anyone. And if you want to run your own hangouts and you want help from the beyond Bitcoin community and support that you can always add the beyond Bitcoin tag to your hangouts or your coverage of different various things and get a higher chance of getting upvoted. Uh, so with that said, Peer Plays this week is at number one, and they are providing some updates. They have been upvoted 36 times, and they are sitting at $147.99. So they are going to be providing their up updates, and we are going to then move to number two, number three, no, number four, and so on. Today we have over seven people who are wanting to talk about various things. So I, we've been running around three hours for these hangouts and they can expand into separate hangouts if we want them to uh, but i will say that if you want to have uh your own hangouts you're more than welcome to do so as well and we'll co we'll cover all of that stuff so thank you peer plays for joining us again this week as you always do pretty much never fails uh are you guys there we certainly are 
Okay, then I'm going to shut my mouth and step down from the the podium and let you step up. And uh, I will just say this before I do, though. Everybody who is here, feel free to ask whatever questions you want. This is a, a free forum. I might run some of it and ask questions whenever no one, ever, no one else has questions. But uh, this is here primarily for you. Thank you very much, Fuzzy. Uh, my name is Jonathan Baha'i. I am the president of Bunker Chain Labs, the company which is heading up the Pure Place project. And this week was the week that we launched the testnet. And uh, we spoke about it for quite some time. And uh, the testnet got launched on Monday this week. And the primary uh, function which we've put into the uh, current testnet is the ability for BTS holders, those are BitShares holders, to be able to uh, check and see what type of balance they could expect to get in pure plays once the actual blockchain launches. So if you went to the testnet, which is, uh, uh, we posted about it on the news site, it's at pureplays.tech, uh, you'd be able to go there. It's very similar to what you've seen in a typical graphene interface. We haven't, uh, we haven't introduced the GUI yet. Uh, the one that we've engineered uh, for the past few months now for uh, the final Pure Plays project, but it's very similar to what you see in Open Ledger. You can go there, uh, put in your private keys from your BitShares wallet, and depending on how many BitShares you had on uh, September 2nd, you will see how many Pure Plays you can expect to receive once the Pure Plays blockchain launches. So uh, over the week, people have been checking, and from what we've gotten in terms of reports, it appears currently that it looks like for approximately every 25,000 BTS uh, people were holding, you got one pure play, which at today's prices is approximately anywhere from uh, $12 to $15. So uh, that's pretty exciting. <laughs> uh, so that's Very what nice happened. Nice. Uh, that's what happened this past week. And so some of the other functions, uh, there's, there's more functionality that's gonna be revealed. We are going to be doing updates on a weekly basis. Uh, the reason for this is because we want to uh, reveal the functions. We don't want to spill it all out at once. So we're taking one step at a time. Uh, some of that is uh, for proprietary purposes to ensure that we don't just have the whole thing copied from others as uh, other elements of the Pure Place project uh, have been copied over the past months. Uh, but uh, uh, going forward, it, it gives everybody a, a chance to be able to uh, do some public testing uh, aside from our private testing. So uh, that's uh, that's primarily what's going on with Pure Place Project right now. And uh, I think I've covered everything. So uh, if I missed anything, I'm sure Michael can take care of it. Yep, I am here, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is Michael Maloney, and I am. Uh, I don't really have anything to add again this week to what Jonathan said. Um, but I see there's a question here that G Chicken just asked. Um, does the BTS snapshot in the in the test net include BTS that was held in open orders yet? No, that's the one thing it doesn't include yet. Um, so technically, the snap if you upload your or if you import your keys uh, right now, it'll be the the balance you'll see will be slightly more. Um, than what your actual balance is, and that's because um, the BTS that was held in open orders on the snapshot date of September 2nd hasn't been included in the the, the mock genesis block that we have uh, have in the testnet now. So we're going to try to get the actual full 100% complete one out uh, pretty soon. But for now, you can get a very close estimate. Um, I don't know exactly what percentage it is by off by, but I'm, I don't think it's more than a percentage or two off. So. Um, so yeah, that's that. Um, and uh, if anyone else has any questions, um, I can answer them now. Uh, G, -Sec, G Chicken says, okay, thanks. I noticed you mentioned it in your announcements, so I just wanted to check. Um, I will ask you, do you guys have enough people for the test net for your, do you feel like you guys are in a place where you're, you're in the sweet spot in, in terms of people testing the network or... Are you guys needing fewer or more or people who are leading some special initiatives with the test net? Are there any specifics regarding that that you guys might need support with? Yeah, that's a good question, and thank you for asking, Fuzzy. Um, yeah, as of, as of right now, we don't have a whole lot up there yet, so I think we're 
pretty good. Um, there's not, you know, a, a huge amount to do. Um, I, I know that in the coming weeks uh, we'll, we'll be at a stage where there will be more and more added. Um, and I, I believe it will it'll be a cumulative effect. So, um, you know, I think we're, once we get, uh, you know, a few things tested out and they're working, then we'll, we'll be moving forward and, and testing more. So, yeah, there will be, um, I'll definitely, um, you know, make sure everybody's aware if, if we do need more help, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll um, put that, uh, like, like Jonathan mentioned, we're going to have a, um, a weekly update, just a weekly sort of, um, you know, written update. I'm probably going to try to do that every Monday, I'm thinking, um, on the PeerPlace.com slash news website, and that'll have kind of the information of what's going to be on the testnet that week. Um, and that's kind of what we did last week. And then um, everybody can kind of look and say, oh, yeah, that's what I want to, uh, you know, come and check out. Or, or maybe, oh, no, that's more trivial stuff that I don't really care about. Or, um, you know, in any case, that will be, um, that'll be, you know, sort of an indication of, of what's going on. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that um, to answer your question, though, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely need more people. But at this stage, there's, there's um, you know, there's not quite enough on there for it to make too much of a difference. Okay, so it's so it's still very very early and at a time when you probably don't want an influx of a bunch of people because a lot of the stuff isn't even out for them to to play around with. Well, sure. I mean, it's not you know it's it's not going to hurt anything if more people come on and check it out. But at this stage, there's um, you know we've just got a, a couple features that we've added this week. So I, I, by all means go on and check it out if you're interested. Um, at the very least, you can, you can check out your, your balance of peer plays, see what you got for your BTS tokens. Um, but we're going to have, um, you know, within a, a week or two here, we're going to have a, a lot more stuff. So, um, you know, keep, keep, keep coming back and checking it out, and uh, you'll, you'll get some new surprises each week. So surprises in a Sounds good way. Sounds awesome. Do you have any uh, idea of the surprises that you might – uh, be talking about specifically. So I've 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 been told at this stage because um, I'm I'm one that likes to just go and go and go and talk about all these <laughs> things as, as, as much as I possibly can. But I I'm I um, what what we'd like to do from this stage is is when something new is on the test net, then I'll come on and ex and talk about it. Um, Fair so we're 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 kind of at the stage now where the the future is, is catching up with the present, so to speak. You know, we've uh, we've been in the um, you know the stage for the last couple months where we haven't really had a whole lot to show. Um, we did release some code earlier this summer, but um, you know, so now we want to kind of synchronize that so that I don't I don't accidentally make promises and have the have the devs come back and say, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute, I did <laughs> we said we said two weeks, not a week, and you know, and then and then uh, people are like, hey, why isn't this here? You know, so we want to. We want it. We don't want to, you know, get people's expectations out of alignment with what's actually going to be there. But, um, but I did get confirmation yesterday that no matter what, there's going to be new things on the test net uh, each week. So, um, you know, that'll at least be something to look forward to. That there's always going to be something new that's that's um, that's coming each week. So. Fair enough, man. Well, I I really appreciate you guys joining us. And does anybody have any questions or comments that they would like to bring up? Uh, I read here one that is written by G uh, G chicken sorry I think it uh, I, I've seen it somewhere but forgot what is the official target for main net launch or is there a published roadmap that you could link to uh, yeah the, the roadmap the original mode roadmap we published back in May uh, is on the peerplays.com slash news site um, I'll have to give me a second so I can go and, and find the link yeah I but, thought I saw it on there yeah so um, and that you know, all, all the dates so far have been right in alignment with that. Um, within, I can tell you that within a couple of weeks, we'll be announcing uh, the rest of the dates. So that'll be the dates for the ICO, the dates for the main la la net launch. Um, we've got, it's going to be a little bit different than what's on there now. Um, but we do have some other exciting things to go along with that that will um, more than justify the, the difference. So um, that announcement, which we're going to hope to try to make that announcement within um, a couple of weeks here. Um, we're, we're just uh, trying to wrap everything up uh, behind the scenes and, and make sure that we're, um, you know, everything's everything's fully uh, ready to go before we, we announce the dates. Um, but 
that said, um, you can kind of go on there if you want to look at all the rest of the stuff in terms of what uh, you know what the features are and what they're going to be and, and stuff. That's all sort of wrapped into our roadmap, um, the original roadmap. And in and, and, and that respect, um, it's, it's pretty much going to be the same as it, as it was on the original. Um, so yeah, we'll have the dates out, though, in, in a few weeks here. Will you be incorporating what's being called Graphene 2.0 in your uh, launch? Um, that is going to depend on whether or not the code is available for us to incorporate. Um, we're not entirely sure what, um, you know, whether it's going to be a, an easy copy paste thing and the licensing is going to be permitting or whether it's going to be only, um, you know, uh, included in the Steam repo and, and um, if there's if there's quite a bit um, that needs to be done in order to sort of retool it to work with um, with the the version of graphene that we're using. Then it probably won't be included in launch. However, um, obviously, it's something that um, we'll look at and, and include when we need to scale at that stage. Um, you know, or, or I, I'm not. You know, I, I don't know the all the ins and outs of it. I read it, but I'm I'm. Uh, you know, there's still some questions that I have about it as well. Um, but um, yeah, so if it's if it's just in the Steam repo and there's quite a bit of you know quite a bit that needs to be done in order to retool it, um, it probably won't be um, as part of the first launch. However, as we all know, uh, with Graphene, it's it's not terribly difficult to to fork new code in when when necessary. I, mean, I should say it's not terribly disruptive to the network to fork in new code. So that you know that'll be something obviously as the network begins to scale. Um, we'll want to make sure that we have all the code that allows us to scale as well. So, thank you. Any other questions? There I want goes. to know a little bit more about the comparison between uh, Peer Place and First Blood. I think everybody know or heard about the the, the big announcement of First Blood, uh, who raised around six million in uh, one day or something, or five million in five minutes at least. So that was pretty crazy. Uh, how are these uh, two platforms uh, similar or different? Yeah, I can I can talk about that a little bit. Um, I mean, obviously, the main sort of core difference is that uh, First Blood is being built on uh, Ethereum. Um, that, as far as we know, limits them to only being able to use um, ETH tokens for wagering. Um, of course. PeerPlays is built on Graphene, which has a decentralized exchange, which has the capability of, of um, you know, wagering with gateway tokens for, you know, every different cryptocurrency or fiat currency and everything else. So we do have a little bit, um, I'll say quite a bit more flexibility um, in terms of the tokens that people are going to be able to wager with. Um, the other main difference um, is that, you know, PeerPlays has um, uh, both on-chain gaming and um, you know the ability to do server-side gaming. Um, I, I guess I won't. I don't need to sort of explain the on-chain gaming side because everyone's been hearing that for the last few months. And um, but to try to highlight uh, specifically the differences between what First Blood is doing um, with their uh, um, uh, esports tournament games. Um, I, I I think they they've well I, I know that they've got a um, they've got a, um, a sort of a scheme set up for uh, being able to report on uh, server side games in a in a specific way. Um, generally, what we have um, so far with peer plays is um, the the tournament uh, brackets that are set up. Um, you know, hard coded into peer plays um, will eventually have uh, the capability to set, uh, or, or I'm sorry, the, the registrar of the tournament will have the capability of setting an oracle um, to say, you know, to to um, report who won the tournament. So that oracle could be the actual server itself that's running the tournament. You know, the the, the admin of the server, um, the the one that has access um, exactly to that data when it happens. Um, it can also be a, a, a group of multi-sig, um, you know, accounts. Uh, you know, um, Graphene has the capability of, of uh, you know, pretty easily, uh, you know, uh, setting up multi different multi-sig weighted uh, account permission sort of schemes. Um, and there are other possibilities as well. 
um, that we can utilize um, even up to um, something similar to what they're doing right now um, with their reporting scheme. Um, at this stage, peer plays is, is uh, the, our, our, our primary focus um, is in going to be in the markets of um, um, both sports betting and um, casino gaming. And the reason for this is, is um, you know, that both of those markets are, uh, you know, literally hundreds of, of, of times larger. Um, in fact, in the, in the case of sports betting, it's, it's thousands of times larger than the esports markets. Um, um, you know, the, the, the um, annual uh, uh, revenue that's being uh, made in these markets is, is, actually, uh, is absolutely tremendous. And there are no other crypto platforms that are currently uh, tackling this um, in any significant manner. Um, there's, there's um, you know, some prediction market uh, projects out there. Um, there hasn't really been any successful casino gaming project out there. Um, and, you know, what's very unique about peer plays and about Graphene is this capability to put casino games directly onto the blockchain, have them be, um, you know, completely decentralized and therefore um, sort of overcoming the, the barriers that um, are, exist right now in terms of a lot of places where you can't um, play against uh, people in certain areas. Um, we've been speaking with someone specifically in France recently that said uh, has been has been uh, talking about the, um, the how how segregated things are in terms of uh, people being able to play in different markets in Europe because there's you know places that have rules and regulations and 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 uh, barriers to entry and all that kind of goes right out the window when you have a decentralized blockchain. Um, so um, so anyway, that's uh, I kind of veered off a little bit, but I wanted to talk about specifically what uh, peer plays is, uh, what we're focusing on. Um, of course, the um, you know the the um, esports games, which are these MMO games, um, are also um, you know there's also a, 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 the capability to do these. And um, I mentioned uh, last week that we actually have created a. Um, the a, an in-game marketplace feature, uh, an eBay, I'm, I'm, I'm coined it or I've been calling it an eBay style marketplace feature because it's very, very similar to the, um, to the auctions that, uh, that eBay uh, allows people to hold. Um, and this is something that we just started looking into about a month and a half ago and, we, and we've built actually this feature. We have the code um, on the back, the back end code already put together um, for this feature on Graphene, so we've been testing it. And uh, this is something actually that um, that, that Neil Haran, I, I believe, will be using for ro uh, robots um, as a, as a sort of the first instance of being able to use this. Um, so that's um, you know sort of an additional feature besides being able to play tournaments. Um, we also have uh, a um, a feature that allows uh, um, people to, to to trade and and, um, and buy and sell uh, in-game merchandise. Uh, using uh, eBay style auctions. Um, so yeah, so I, I guess what I just did there is sort of gave you all of the things that Peer Place has that First Blood doesn't have. Um, and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that was an adequate explanation of the differences between the two. Um, is in terms of their auction, um, yeah, I, I, I did see they were very successful with that, and were you know that's 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 great. Um, you know, every project that we see that. Um, you know, in this space, that that um, you know that that's an indication that there's just a lot of people out there that want to see, uh, you know, gaming come to crypto, and um, you know, so that's nothing but good news um, in terms Can I of. Ask uh, you guys a question, I, just a, a a quick. I, I hate being a negative Nancy on this, but I, I try to take the opposite end sometimes on this stuff, and I find myself also also wondering though, like, do we know for sure that the five million dollars like how that five million dollars came in because if it all comes in on one day at one time i always think to myself you know people should at least ask the question i it's i don't know it's not a crowd fund I, it's a single funding at that point right one yeah, major investor we know yeah well we do know that that Yunbi uh put in i i don't know the exact number but i i heard that it was close to four million so that that Jeez. Prob that's probably you know the, uh, the crux of that, um, and naturally you know you see in a any crowdfund, um, even you know IPOs, traditional crowdfunds, that if there's uh, enough 
um, you know, if there are, if there are large investors that come in and, and and put money into the project, then you're going to get a lot of minnows that that want to get in as well because it's like, oh, okay, this this project is fully funded; it's going to go somewhere. Yeah. So, you know, we're going to throw our our lot in with the mix, and so that's you know that's a very effective way, um, you know, to to sort of boot, to to um, you know, jumpstart your crowdfund is to have a, a large investor like that. So that's a, you know, yeah. So the, in, in that respect, they did it, you know, the right way. Um, I'm not entirely sure the reason why they capped it, except that, um, you know, perhaps they were being responsible and they and they knew how much money that they were going to need. And so they decided to, you know, do that rather than, um, you know, raise additional money. Um, in my mind, there's, you know, there's always, there's always ways to utilize that more also- money. I mean... Well, but that also sure. makes Unity a majority stakeholder, then, doesn't it? So that could be a reason for capping it as well, couldn't it? Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure if us. I, I mean, yeah, yes, that makes sense that they're a majority s- stakeholder. I, I don't know. I don't not sure why that would um, necessarily have to, you know, um, require them capping the the uh, the fun, you know, the the, the sale. Um, I don't know. I, I I I think they're out of Hong Kong. Um, I believe not. Not well, Yunbi, but but also um, First Blood. Um, if they're not out of Hong Kong, I, I believe they're somewhere in in China. Um, so there 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 may be regulations there concerning something that that I'm not aware of. But um, but in any case, yeah, that's that's um, that's the reason why they they got a, a significant amount in the short period of time. I believe is is that they had a very um, you know they had a large uh, stakeholder that came in and bought up um, you know four fifths of the of the of the sale right away. So Yeah, and that and that stakeholder is an exchange. Which all of this kind of brings brings me to the question, you know, could BitShares do this? Like, you know <laughs> but anyway, continue. If I'm sorry, I, I, I just these some of the things that you're bringing up, it's it's very interesting though. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm actually going to um, probably wrap it up here though so I don't go over my time period. And um, yeah, Chris, hopefully Thank that you answered your question about the differences um, between our platforms. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Fuzzy, and thank everyone else. Um, and uh, I will see you guys next week. Okay, and you guys have uh, a peerplays.chat, Rocket Chat channel. Uh, people can check your updates at peerplays.com forward slash news. Uh, and there's contact information to reach out to you guys on there correct uh yes sir there's uh there's the peer place uh slash news um and also on steemit um if you follow uh peer place the username peer place is what we use to post all the uh the new announcements and stuff on steemit so awesome and uh the peer plays account is the one that they should follow on steemit uh yes yes the peer plays account is just called uh peer plays All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. Yes, sir. Thank you, Fuzzy, and thank you, everybody else. And to all of those who are listening, who are out there investing in ICOs and different technologies in the crypto scene, always remember to support the projects that are transparent and are willing to go out in public and answer questions to people from people who actually have invested in the project or may be interested in doing so. Um, 
it's always a good thing to keep a hold of because in this ecosystem, we all know it's the wild, wild west. So you never know exactly what you're going to get. Uh, one thing we do know is that you get a lot of good promises and there's a lot of hope. Uh, we have to all stick together and kind of find the best things and the stuff that the people we can trust the most and developers and teams who are open and transparent show that they have that level of trust. So thank you guys for all of you who show up here to uh, kind of prove that about your projects. Uh, second up today is Chris4210 of BitShares Munich. Uh, with block pay updates, latest news from the bit sh uh, the bits and pretzels blockchain after party, and new locations of block uh, block pay around the world, uh, and they are sitting with eleven votes and nine dollars and twenty three cents. So I think we are already on it. So yeah, thank you very much, Fuzzy, to uh, give us another good opportunity to talk about BlockPay. We really want to give a short update. It has been basically a really, really fun week. I have to say we had a lot of people on the Bits and Bretzels. We had uh, Richard Branson there. We had Kevin Spacey there. And then, of course, also a couple of really major people Kevin from Spacey. the Bitchers as well. So that was really, really a fun event. And uh, we had our own trade booth. And uh, I think uh, Ken will also share a couple of the pictures uh, that we have on Steam. So if you didn't saw them yet, uh, I really would recommend that you take a look at them because we had a really cool um, block pay stand there and we were selling actually uh, gummy bears with Bitcoin. Awesome. Yeah, Kevin Spacey was... Not quite was, as awesome as Kevin Spacey, though. Yeah, he, he was pretty crazy on stage, I really have to say, because he was doing the House of Card scenery, and uh, he, he was really delivering a really, really nice presentation on stage. And uh, unfortunately, we couldn't really grab him, you know, like we really wanted to talk about blockchain with him, but... Um, he was he was too fast in and out, so it was not not really uh, possible. Uh, but at the end, it was still uh, a really cool three day event, and um, we talked a lot also because we had a couple of good blockchain startups uh, at the Bits and Pretzels as well. So we were talking a lot with Eric Borges from Shapeshift. We were talking with Adam Stranding, for, former co-founder of Bitcoin.com, and uh, we had Bitvala at the stage. We had. Uh, Bruce Pon uh, as well there from Ascribe and BigchainDB. So we really had a lot of blockchain talk. And um, I'm very actually very excited that we even have uh, Siroc uh, in Munich, for Fabian, if some of them already know him. So he came. And then we also had Once Up a Time coming all the way from Canada visiting us in Munich. So that was really, really cool. Uh, he came with his brother. And uh, we had a fun, fun couple of days here. We went to the Oktoberfest together. And we shared a couple of beers. And I think what, what is like actually really the best event is we organized a, a blockchain after party after the bits and pretzels. And we had around uh, 25, uh, almost 30 people showing up. And uh, they all could buy the beer and the baked handle, uh, everything with Bitcoin. And we had a couple of people who bought their stuff in Dash. So that was really, really an awesome night. And I really uh, encourage you to look at the pictures to see what happened that night. And uh, yeah, think about if that would be possible uh, in, in your town, in your city as well. Wow. So I know I saw a bunch of the pictures from the booth and all that stuff. I didn't know that you guys had actually made some sales. Um, yeah, Ken Code was talking about Voltoro, and you said that uh, Voltoro was there. Did you guys end up talking to them at all? Uh, yes, we were talking actually a lot with uh, Joshua from Voltoro, the, the CEO and founder. Uh, we actually were hanging out with him. I was hanging out with uh, Joshua and uh, Eric and uh, the team from Shapeshift. So there was uh, Mac and Emily. And uh, we were like just you know, hitting hard the Oktoberfest, drinking beers all day and uh, uh, chilling in a couple of the, of the carnival uh, things. So that was uh, a lot of fun, basically. So it was fun and work at the same time. Yeah, uh, definitely. It was also networking and uh, it is good. Uh, we showed them basically what is BlockPay and how is it connected with BitShares and what we really want to do. And uh, it was good that they really like the idea. They like where we are going. And uh, yeah, they're looking basically really forward to, to hear more about uh, what we will bring up with BitShares and with BlockPay and so on. So out of curiosity, what, what are some responses that you guys receive with respect to BitShares technology that you guys are using since you guys are BitShares Munich? 
Uh, I think a lot of people really like uh, what they see. I think they really like especially the easy design because, you know, when you look at the smart coins wallet and the block pay, it's very easy to use. And uh, we had we had tons of people from all all kind of different industries showing up at the trade booth and looking at the stuff. Uh, we had uh, casinos, we had a gas station coming up, we had a couple of toy stores uh, who really would like to start accepting digital currencies, but they don't really know how to get started and they really like our simple uh, interface and I think in the back end yes uh, it is all driven by by bit shares and uh, people are curious how we can how we can make that why is it so fast why, how is it secure so uh, they, they're listening and hearing more and more about uh, the different technical aspects that bit shares really can provide yeah it's it's kind of interesting to see how you guys are pushing forward and peer place is pushing forward in a different demographic area. I mean, let's face it, there are all people who are into blockchain technologies to a degree are, are nerds. Uh, but we're starting to get to the point where we're, where people are starting to see this technology emerge that we've been, you know, talking about for what almost three years now. So it's really cool to see how all of you are hitting on different fronts and getting good responses from every front. Yeah, I think like what people or um, companies really, really like is the multi-currency aspect so that they re really can say, uh, it doesn't really matter what you have, you know, you can use, uh, you, you can have a Dash or you can have a Doge or a Litecoin. It doesn't really matter. BlockPay really gives you the opportunity to, to use them in the daily life to buy beer, or food, or clothes or wherever you have a BlockPay station. Actually, I just wanted to share with you a movie. We had uh, one of the first community meetups in Colombia by one of our ambassadors. Um, Miguel was giving a presentation and talking about Bitcoin and Steam and especially about BlockPay as well. And it just posted a link about that. So that was really impressive. So we have, with all our ambassadors now, they're really getting started to come to local community events, to go there, to talk about Bitcoin, to talk about blockchain and uh, sharing the word. And they are really, really active. And uh, I think that is really beautiful to see because as it is a lot of interest and people really want to learn more about it. And I think we're going to see a huge uh, success. Even uh, when I looked at the, the signups so far, we have, I think, since the launch of BlockPay, we have more than 200 new accounts on the BitShares blockchain. Uh, uh, it also means that BitShares Munich is actually the biggest refer right now on the blockchain after Open Ledger. So it's another reason where we really can see more and more people are coming into the BitShares blockchain, coming into our ecosystem and experiencing all the cool features that we have. Yeah, it's... <laughs> It's cool, and I can't wait to see what's going to happen when more and more people are able to buy uh, beer with BitUSD or BitEuro or you know, BitCNY or you know, any of these different uh, cryptos that are offered. Well, at the end, it's it's just really super easy, and I think that makes it very interesting because uh, everybody really can can use it, and uh, a lot of people can set it up. And what we are working on right now is to have more uh, easy tutorials uh, that you can uh, basically really go step by step by step. Okay, how do you download the application? How do you create an account? How do you activate the the fast transaction feature with block trades so that we really have a nice tutorial for merchants to get started and also for users and i think the more we actually working on it we get a lot of tons of new ideas uh, how you can really uh, combine for example the smart coins wallet and the block pay station and it's something that i didn't really post it yet about but i was talking with a couple of people and merchants about it. Uh, the beautiful thing of BlockPay here really is, and I'm very excited, is you can use BlockPay, um, you can customize the application a lot to your own community because it's all based on the BitShares platform. So we accept more or less natively all BitShares tokens. So what does it mean? That means if you have, like, say, a own uh, token or coin for your own little community, you can use the smart coins wallet for holding all these tokens, and you can use the block pay as a business version to pay and use the tokens back in the store. So that means you are not even 
grounded to just use Bitcoin or just use Dash. If you have your own little city currency, let's say you have your currency like a hip hipster currency in, in New York and you have block pay all over New York, you have a lot of community members who want to use the hipster currency, then you can set up these little communities and live within that community where you can always use the coin, spend it, uh, reward them, pay salaries and everything. Maybe the coin will not be useful if you go to Los Angeles, but within that community, it's going to be very helpful. And uh, it is all for free. You know, you pay a little fee, of course, to, um, to, to pay, but to set it up, to create a token on the BitShares platform, to use the smart coins app, to use the block pay app, it's totally free. And you can really uh, scale that on every kind of platform. So you have your own currencies, you have your own networks, you have your own loyalty rewards. It is really amazing, actually, what you can do uh, with this kind of system. Chris, have you approached um, Jeff Berwick of uh, uh, the Dollar Vigilante about uh, incorporating block pay for Great for use at his for well, use we at were his talking with him on, on one of the hangouts a little bit uh, tighter but I think he was just too consumed with steam uh, I would love to talk with him about that because we see that uh, a lot of uh, conferences and uh, also a lot of events are now starting to look into that because they say like hey we want to have a multi digital currency uh, point of sales we want to use that and uh, how can we do that and they are talking with us and we're looking into into the details and if he has one of the big events coming up yeah why not we can we can set him totally up uh, to have the point of sales in all of his vendors food trucks entry points wherever he wants to get paid with digital currencies jules is asking so clarify this for me is this not all dependent on merchants actually adopting the use of block pay or am i missing something well it is all dependent on two things the first thing is that the merchant has to uh, have the app so he has to have block pay in any kind of form either integrated or on the app in his store uh, and once he has it you know the app is for free um, if he has an old tablet even better then he doesn't have to pay anything if he doesn't has a tablet yet then he maybe has to buy one but he can buy a used one uh, for like 150 euro or even less so that is that is not really a big investment the bigger challenge gonna be we need to uh, inform now the Bitcoin and all the blockchain communities that once they see our block pay logo that they understand here at this spot today I can pay with crypto I can use my coins and that's where we really have to connect and talk Anyhow. with a lot of people about that uh, because uh, when when we basically put up a block pay in a store and half a year later nobody came to pay because the crypto community is not accepting that yeah then then we lose yeah then we will not find mass adoption so um, I guess your marketing approach then will emphasize the multi-currency aspect of it and downplay because of the negative press that we've had over the over the past years the BitShares connection and when they ask for details then of course you you disclose that it's all based on BitShares and that's why you get the performance and other benefits but uh, as far as marketing and reaching people that don't care at all about BitShares might even be negative against BitShares might be best to focus on the multi-currency aspect and so it sounds like that's what you're doing. Well, so far, we don't have any bad uh, feedback that we are using BitShares. Uh, I see nobody uh, who, who is really basically negative about it. Uh, as I said a couple of times before, uh, we have over 10,000 views on Bitcoin Talk, almost 20 pages, and uh, nobody's really bitching about that, that we use BitShares as a backend technology. Uh, so I don't really see a problem here uh, because we can scale and we can use it. And it works basically with all the other communities. And I think what we really want to do is we want to unite the different platforms. Because if you can imagine uh, like a Dash community or uh, like a Litecoin community or maybe the new upcoming Zcash community, uh, if they really want to get into a store, they they will never make it. It takes them so much effort. They have to scale so many uh, so many times in user base and features and in, in infrastructure. They in the next ten years, a dash will never be really in a supermarket unless they are using the block pay uh, infrastructure. So I think that will that will open a lot of eyes for the people. Is block pay actually brings all these um, border currencies or small minority currencies into the light so that it can really use it.
and uh, at the end, how we really do that uh, for the user doesn't really matter because if you have a Dash wallet and you can pay, so what? You pay it, you could use it, you have your uh, anonymity, you follow your ideology of using Dash and that's it. Okay, so let's just say I create fuzzballs and I want to pass them out to everybody here at these Hangouts or the Hangouts that I run in the future, you know, whatever Hangouts those are. And they're going to get an upvote using those. They can pay a bot to upvote something. Now, because that has value, would I be able to actually, or all of us, be able to buy beer with fuzz? Uh, at the end, yeah, probably. You would be able, if, if there's a market where we can basically sell the fastballs and get bit euro for that, then you could use it. Plus, you have grab feature and uh, uh, Spark as well, too, man. Yeah, so Ken is just saying we also have the, the overdraft feature. So if you don't have enough fastballs or the fastballs are nothing worth, then you can use your, your reserve or backend uh, uh, currency and then you can use bit shares or uh, bit dollar or whatever. But what you can imagine, this is what I talked before. Uh, let's imagine you have uh, in your town, Fuzzy, you have a uh, point of sales, you have block pay everywhere, and everybody's using the smart coins wallet. And if you now start to promote your fuzzy balls, then yeah, maybe that you can use as a currency. So everybody except fuzzy balls, you can buy your, your band cakes, your beers, your, whatever you need with that, and everybody's happy. Take an, Take Uber. an Uber, yeah. If that is in your local town, if everybody accepts it as a currency, yes, of course. <laughs> so basically, you can really, yeah, this is a beautiful thing with block pay. Balls. <laughs> you can really uh, customize it. I would Nobody avoid steal that Uber asset. Driver, if he takes fuzzy balls, though, that would be uh, that might that might not work. <laughs> yeah, it did not. I said fuzz balls, okay, like the like yeah, the, yeah, the hair balls hair that uh, cats, you know. <laughs> you guys can take that wherever so the you want legal to. Legal brothels in Vegas will be able to take orgasms. If, if there's a market, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, oh, yeah but true. I think like we have to consider one thing. Um, because we got approached by a couple of smaller communities. Uh, a supermarket itself, as far as I understand it so today, uh, he has to decide between like f uh, five and seven currencies they really can accept all the time. So if you have a hundred different currencies, they could maybe accept on their screen, they just have five. Otherwise you have a giant screen with thousands of different currencies, which is a mess and will not be uh, beneficial. Uh, but if you have that on a website, for example, yes, you could, for example, pull provide all the different currencies and use a filter to really go down to your small local currency. Uh, this is this is the thing. So, for example, a Walmart who just has a limited space on his screen, he will just choose the top five currencies. Uh, but an online store, so, yeah, maybe he takes fast balls. And if you have your own community, your own town, uh, with all your friends, or you have, you know, your bar ring, you hang out with all of your friends, then yeah, maybe you can you can set up these currencies and uh, pay them and use them. And uh, I think what what is here actually really the most mind blowing thing is actually uh, block pay is structured in a decentralized way. So all the time there is no middleman. Uh, we just discussed it with a couple of other um, service providers in this area. Is when you for example use uh, Coinbase or BitPay, the merchant actually has a centralized account with BitPay, and BitPay has the private keys and has total control over the funds that the merchant receives. Uh, with BlockPay, it's totally different. In BlockPay, the merchant has all the private keys and he has total control. So that means the merchant really is independent of any kind of uh, any kind of middleman because you have network between the consumer and the merchant. Directly. That's a really important point. I, I'm, I hope you stress that because a lot of people just don't understand the risks they take with these centralized exchanges, unfortunately. Yeah, that that is very important, and uh, I think it gets more and more clear the more we talk about uh, these issues that with block pay, it is really a, a completely decentralized way how to uh, use point of sales in the stores, and uh, you as a business, how you have control over your own funds. Do you Jules guys have any talking? Sorry, go do ahead. you have do you, that's, uh, do you have any updates regarding uh, a stealth work that's uh, perhaps going on in the background? 
Uh, yeah, we have a couple of updates. So we are now Ken is working very hard on um, on the development plans because you know you have to look into what we all need. And uh, the last three weeks he was basically working on that. And um, he's also looking for the right uh, coders because you can imagine this is a very sensitive topic. So we need to really have uh, the best people. And uh, I don't know if Ken has uh, wants to add something personal on this topic. Uh, but we're moving forward very fast, and I think we're going to have a couple of more announcements pretty soon about that. Thank you. Jules is bringing something up here, uh, talking about, or well, he's asking some questions about the legalities of, you know, how this is treated at the, you know, for the merchant level. Uh, and, I mean, would you like to, here, actually, I'll go ahead and I'll read off some of it. Go back to his question about the taxes. That's that's a pretty important one for merchants. Yeah, that was the big one that I was... Okay, he says here, so how does a merchant's ability to accept block pay pay into uh, factor into IRS auditing and s declaring income or, for taxes? After, you, after you're going to explain this to merchants, or is that something they'll need to look into themselves? As you may know, this isn't exactly the most straightforward thing, even with something like PayPal. Well, I think here it is very important that uh, every merchant at the beginning, before they really get uh, started to accept the digital currencies, they really have to look into that aspect. And they also have to co uh, consult their tax account about that. So because in every country you have different regulations, uh, especially like, for example, in Germany, it is called, it is not really a currency, it's more like an asset. And... Um, there are specific rules how you have to tax it. But in general, it is managed basically like cash. So when you receive a Bitcoin as a payment, you book that as cash. And at the end, you need to have exact uh, the timestamp. When did you receive the Bitcoin? What was the value of the, that moment? And then you can basically give that to your tax accountant and he will do all the rest. What we are doing here is we are working very tight with all of our block pay ambassadors to really, this is actually the first job they will get. If you are applying to be a blockchain, ambassador with us uh, you look into the local tax code and uh, into the regulatories so that you're really sure that you have uh, that you don't run in any kind of troubles here and of course uh, when they are going to promote block pay on the street and if they go to the businesses then they already have all the technology and the, the legal background they know exactly how to manage that uh, in the in the country so, for example, in, in America, it's a little bit different than in, in Canada, and it's different in Mexico, and it's different in, in Europe. So, for the merchant itself, yes, he has to take that into consideration at the beginning uh, and to look what I need to do to comply to all the regulations. Well, just one question. Because this is connected up with things like uh, Odoo, these are essentially going to be pretty much guaranteed perfect data error-free data for tax accountants to be looking at or for irs people to be auditing so i would imagine that that would make the system uh more beneficial to people who are wanting to make sure that they're in line with you know the tax laws and things like that yeah, I think at the end, um, how you have to, <clears throat> how you have to see block pay basically is it is like a, a credit card machine in the store. You, you know, you go to a bar, you buy some drinks or you go out for dinner and you want to pay with your card. You have these EC card readers, uh, the electronic cash card readers and block pay is actually just the same, just working with digital currencies. So at the end, uh, the company, they have to pay all, all, all of their taxes. Uh, they have to send it to their tax uh, company and so on. So that will not really help them if they want to make it clean. I mean, like if they are somewhere in Latin America or in Asia where the laws are a little bit more flexible, that is their own topic. That's their own beer, how we say it in Germany. Um, but what we really provide is basically we provide them all the information they need to be tax compliant. So in terms of the, of the time, the date, the products, the amount, uh, even potentially uh, the different tax codes that have been used in this transaction, etc., so that the merchant can just take that and this is also why we have introduced the e-receipt uh, in the block pay so in block pay when you open up uh, the menu you can see that we have a field of all the transactions 
and uh, there you can actually um, s download uh, the full transaction history uh, of this BitShares account, which is quite interesting because there is no other way today how to get that. So you can have basically uh, the whole transaction history of the day, of the week, of the months, uh, three months and 12 months. So at the end, the merchant can just get that in a PDF file and in a CSF file for Excel or for any other kind of accounting tool and give that to the tax accountant and say, okay, this is this is all the transactions. And then they can match that with their own uh, bills they have with their own regular um, point of sales machine and with their cash register. And then they can say, okay, uh, on Friday, 12 p.m., I got this amount with that uh, dinner or with that uh, meal, and, and then they can be fully compliant to all regulations and requirements. Um, Jules is bringing up another point here. Now, before I get into it, though, I, we have about five more minutes for you guys. Is there anybody else who has... A question other than this one, or would they like me to continue on along this line? Maybe I want. Uh, I see there's a couple of questions about the iOS uh, topic. So right now, um, uh, we've already tried a couple of times to get uh, the first smart coins wallet into the iOS App Store into the Apple Store. Uh, we didn't made it because there was a lot of reasons because of this weird thing of uh, certified currencies uh, that are allowed. Um, still, we are trying and we are looking forward to, to get the right consulting here so that we can be really sure that we can ping, uh, put the smart coins wallet and the block pay uh, onto the Apple Store so that we can also support all the iPhones and iPads uh, on the market because, of course, that is a big market. Uh, there are a lot of uh, restaurants and bars who use that and a lot of private people who want to use the smart coins wallet on the iPhones and uh, we want to do that in the future as well so that we can really provide a version for them as well but that's going to be uh, a little bit trickier and I think at the end we really have to see uh, what is the best way to get into the Apple Store and I also have to think maybe we have to uh, limit uh, block pay in the smart coins wallet just to the certified uh, currencies, similar like JAX is doing it, so that they say uh, with JAX you only can have uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Dash, and uh, no other other currencies. So we really have to see uh, over the next couple of weeks uh, what is the best approach to talk with Apple and to get in. So Apple does support crypto some cryptocurrencies already then? Yes, they support a limited amount. Uh, I think it's like five or six different currencies uh, that they support and everything else is not, uh, what is it, allowed, uh, I would say. Uh, but the funny thing is actually that they have a OneCoin app uh, in the Apple Store. So apparently OneCoin is a, is a proof currency. Um, it's a little bit strange. <laughs> And so you're saying that the Apple Store isn't the the place to go for the best cryptos in the world? No, unfortunately not. Uh, especially not in diversity. So I think that uh, the Apple Store, if there will ever be, for example, a Zcash Cash uh, app for iOS, I think that's going to be very hard to get in uh, because Zcash Cash with the new anonymity feature is going to be, uh, yeah, a different different cookie. But I think. I just lost the, uh, the the idea. Well, whenever you stop searching for it, it'll come to you. So do we have uh, any other questions uh, regarding block pay? Uh, I I think we can leave it on the one coin on Apple uh, Store. That uh, it's kind of interesting to just let yeah people that that was really that rare one. that it's still <laughs> one coin and that they have their wallet i think one one more uh, last thing for everybody listening because we also have a larger uh, audience outside of the live stream uh, we created a new Steam account uh, regarding all topics of BlockPay, Echo, and Stealth. It is called BitShares Munich. And uh, please follow the new account. And uh, we're going to have all the future uh, official announcements running over that new Steam account so that we have basically everything under one brand. And uh, we will not use our private accounts for public announcements anymore. That's a great idea. 
so that basically at the end you're going to have uh, one account that you can follow and i would uh, would really uh, ask you to to go to that site that uh, can just uh, post it so it's uh, at bitchers dash munich uh, follow that account uh, like our post re uh, what is it re steam them and uh, would love to have a couple of more discussions over there so that we have basically everything under one uh, account and that's going to make it easier to to stay up to date with the latest news well thank you guys very much for always showing up and being uh so transparent with what you're doing and letting everybody ask questions whether they're the easy softball questions or some curveballs uh, these are the types of things that we all have to ask uh questions to the people who have accepted uh, money as chris calls it energy uh, to be able to try to build something that is awesome with this technology. Uh, we all do know that it's a niche area and we're trying to find nerds who play with that, this stuff because not just because it's, it's too easy, but you know, we're getting there. We're getting there over time. Uh, it's taken what nine years to get to where we are from Bitcoin. Uh, so, you know, we've got a long way to go, but you know, we're getting there. Uh, so with that said, um, you guys have a website that is called, uh, blockpay.ch. And, um, don't you guys have a telegram group for blockpay as well? Uh, yes, we also have a telegram uh, group as well as a Slack. Um, but I'm trying to figure out what is really the best uh, communication channel for, for all of us. Uh, I think right now it's still going to be Steam, so we're going to have that all over the place. Uh, but if you want to get in contact with us, um, we also you can find us basically our Slack channel and, uh, and our uh, Telegram channel very easily, and also on uh, okay. Twitter. Same and uh, maybe uh, just another thing before we, we, we end completely, um, Rodrigo was working very hard with all of our uh, uh, ambassadors. We, we set up a, a global team of 10 uh, country managers who are now in charge of all the different uh, continents. And we set up local language uh, Facebook pages. So when you are going, if you're just speaking Spanish and you want to know more about Bitcoin and blockchain and uh, about BlockPay, then you will find a channel for Latin America, BlockPay, uh, I think uh, Mexico, for example, is one of the channels where one of our ambassadors will share news and updates all translated into Spanish and uh, Portuguese so that we can also reach people uh, in these areas. And they also started to organize events uh, talking about blockchain and Bitcoin, especially in Mexico, uh, where, where there are not so many big uh, meetups yet. So we are also starting uh, promoting blockchain all over the world. Awesome. Well, it's cool that you guys are reaching out in all these different languages, and I think it's probably one of the things that is most underrated uh, because we're trying to reach out to the third world countries, especially for banking in a box. So, uh, you know, the, <laughs> the ambassador program is wicked smart. All right. Uh, looks like we are at number three today, uh, which is Pro for Never, who is going to be giving an update on the jewels project uh conquer heroes has officially launched at www.conquerheroes.com you can check out the uh, jewels project at www.jewelsproject.com uh, and they would like to discuss the official launch of conquer heroes the first major use case for the jewels coin and uh are you guys ready to go I sure am. Thanks for having me on again. Yeah, of course. Every time, man. Uh, we love to have people on who are not afraid to talk about what's going on with their projects. Because, you know, like I keep saying, it's a dangerous world out there for people who are wanting to invest in ICOs. And this is a good place and a good way for people to uh, prove the value of their ICO before they ever have it or you know, and afterwards. For sure. And as a programmer, it can be very easy for me to get sucked into my work and uh, sort of leave the updates for sort of last on the to-do list. But uh, coming to these really allows me to, to go over the progress of the week, what we're planning to do, and just sort of where we stand with everything. That way we can make sure that all of our investors and people who are involved in the community 
sort of know exactly what's going on with the project. Well, thank you very much, man. So the, the main thing that we wanted to come on and talk about was that as of late last Friday, the official launch of Conquer Heroes happened. Uh, so we've been doing a number of different advertisement campaigns for that. We've been hard at work nailing down any final bug reports that people have submitted, uh, adding a little bit more content to the game, improving the website integration and in terms of jewels and functionality. So that's been going really, really well. And uh, the, the main thing that we've been able to get done there is making sure that the jewels integration is complete. We have the deposit functionality added. We have the, the guide for people who want to purchase through uh, exchanges and with Bitcoin. And we also have our uh, PayPal processor online. So for those who are not familiar, we do accept PayPal payments for the, the jewels themselves, but there are limitations. Those coins are, are marked as unsafe or immature because there is the always the risk of a chargeback. So players who are more used to sort of a one-click buy now option can go through that and they can buy their in-game goodies, their, their VIP status, their fancy looking garment or weapon. Uh, because that stays within the system. But if they wanted to withdraw those jewels to an exchange or, or something along those lines, the uh, they, they would have to have passed the 45-day uh, period, after which point there is no chargebacks. Uh, that limit, of course, does not apply to jewels brought in off of exchanges or ones purchased with uh, any sort of crypto. So, out of curiosity, um, you guys are now launched. People can buy their tokens of course like you said they're not they're immature whenever they first get them because until that chargeback time is over uh, but they can start using those tokens to buy stuff in game and all that stuff and uh you guys are pretty much to the point where anybody can do this right now right Correct. Yeah, we had that integrated within the second day of the server. Uh, once every stability issue with the server, the advertisements were were up, we unlocked the, the shop after all of our testing was complete. And we have had a number of people already using it. Uh, and they've been going through with the, the limited selection that we have available right now is mostly in-game VIP status, which unlocks some bonus features. Uh, some cosmetics, so fancy looking armors, that sort of thing. In the coming weeks, we're also going to be introducing uh, a number of new options in terms of what you can unlock with jewels in the game. But those uh, first use cases have been quite popular with players and the, the server has been growing quite nicely. Uh, we have a, a second set of advertisements launching this weekend. Uh, we found historically that advertising through the week is great, but in terms of the, the large pushes, we generally want those on the weekend when players have the, the extra time that they can devote to, to starting a new game. Sure. Now, out of curiosity, um, I, I'm just kind of curious about the Jules tokens themselves. Mm -hmm. Do they... What is the inflation model for that? Can you give everybody kind of an understanding of how more jewels are created? Yeah, so it is proof of stake. So the those that are staking their wallets that have jewels that they gained through an exchange or from the ICO, if they have those withdrawn, they can start staking and the block reward is half a jewel every minute. So the, the inflation rate is very low, actually. It's, it's not adding very much per year. And that, of course, is intentional. We don't want uh, a huge inflation. We want to encourage people to, to use the coins. We want them uh, used in our game, but also in the upcoming gambling games that are going to be released. Awesome. So if you are somebody who is playing Conquer Heroes today, you can go get a wallet, buy some tokens, and stake them. And basically get free tokens to buy stuff in the game just by running yes de depending on how many jewels you had obviously if you have a, a very low number uh you're you're not likely going to hit the block reward but yes you would be getting a small amount over time okay yeah it's it's something that i i kind of think is an interesting thing to bring up and i know that you probably don't have numbers because this is a live thing where you know you didn't know this question was going to be coming at you, but it would be interesting to see because a lot of people go out and they will pay a lot of money for in-game items. But if you're somebody who plans on, you know, creating a guild, for say, 
a, in something like Conquer Heroes, and you want to be able to buy a bunch of stuff for yourself and other people over time, you could hold those. Uh, you could buy a bunch of them. I'm assuming for I don't know how much it would cost, but that would be an interesting thing to find out. Would be how much would it cost to be able to, you know, buy various, uh, you know, mid grade items for people who are just starting out in the game who want to be part of your guild, for instance. You know, things like that. Yeah, that is definitely possible. Uh, there is a link in chat there to the coin market cap. We just have that set up as a, a JSON query right now for other sites that may wish to integrate it. Uh, since the, the launch, there has been about 17.7 thousand jewels mined, or, or in this case, staked. Yeah, it'll be interesting to watch the market. Uh, is there um, a link to the marketplace, or is it in the game, or how does that work exactly? So the, the marketplace to actually use jewels on in-game items is embedded on the Conquer Heroes website. What we're doing right now is we've actually integrated a HTML5 compatible browser into the game itself. So right now we're designing an alternate skinned version of that so that it'll be very user friendly to access from inside the game. So you won't have to exit the game, go to the website, buy your jewels, go to the shop, buy the items, and then go back in game to claim them. You'll just be able to click a button in game. You'll see all the list of items, how many jewels you have, you can go ahead and one click purchase or get your deposit address to, to deposit them from an exchange. And then you can go ahead and buy them right from there. Uh, so that should be coming out within the next couple of days. We did have a couple delays with that just in terms of the, the formatting and the front end design, but that is just in its final testing stages right now. Sure. And, and, and of course, there's just one more thing that I'll ask before I uh, open it up to everybody else. Uh, uh, there's a login here that I'm actually on the site. Um, I downloaded Conquer Heroes last week, but I was busy editing the uh, interview that I had done with Trezor. I haven't gotten the chance to make an account yet, but if I go here and I want to go to the shop, it asks me to log in. Uh, is that done intentionally for like a security reason? Uh, the main reason that is there is so that it will display your proper amount of jewels and it will make sure that you're confirming what account you want the, the rewards to go to. Because a lot of people will have mm -hmm. multiple accounts and so you want to have, uh, you want to be very sure that they're crediting it to the right account because if not you'll end up with quite a, a few player issues where they'll, they'll come in and say, well, I, I tried to buy items and it said I didn't have jewels, but I do have jewels, and it turns out they're they're just on the the wrong the wrong account or the wrong character. One, yeah, that makes one hundred percent sense. I can understand that now. Thank you for the clarification. Now, um, I personally would like to know if anybody here has tested it out or has looked at it yet, or if anybody has any questions about it. Um, uh, this is a, an open forum. I will remind you consistently because it's very, very easy for me to just talk and ask the questions that I want because I'm very curious about all this stuff and, you know, digging nose deep in it like most of you. But I'm also extremely talkative. So if there are other people who want to step up and ask questions, feel free to do so. Um, you know, this is what this is here for. Okay, well, while we wait for those questions, I'm assuming most of them will be in chat. I'll just go over a, a few of the, the things that we've added throughout the, the week since the servers launched, if that's all right with you. Sure, man. Okay, so the uh, the game, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, is online. So we've been going through all of the, the bug reports, cleaning up some of the just user issues where maybe a quest doesn't work quite the way it should, or there's some text wrong. So we've, of course, been fixing those up. But we've also been able to add about 18 new daily quests since the launch because one of the things that we didn't quite predict, predict is that uh, players want to be able to have a lot more daily quests. We had, I, I think, about five or six added at launch, and the number one request was that they wanted more. So we've uh, added about 18 of them since launch. Uh, in every different area of the game, there's about four or five new ones. Uh, and then we've also unlocked our new referral system. So that's uh, one of the really big ways that we're hoping to, to push advertisement of the game. Historically, we've been using newsletters to our existing mailing list, Facebook ads, because it allows us to target very specific types of, of video game players. Uh, but the, the new way that we're looking to push that is through referrals. So players are able to log in on our website to their dashboard, and it'll give them a referral link that they can send to their friends. 
And uh, when someone signs up with that link and reaches level 70 in game, which only takes maybe an hour, oftentimes less if you're helping them, uh, both them and yourself will be rewarded with uh, a temporary cosmetic garment that lasts seven days that exposes people to the, the types of cosmetics that they can purchase on the site in a, a limited duration fashion. And they also get a three day trial of the VIP system for both players and one hour of double experience. So that way, if as you mentioned earlier, if you're a guild leader and maybe you're coming in from a different game, you have an existing community, you can bring those players in, you can help them get started, but it's a, sort of a symbiotic thing where both them and yourself are getting the rewards. And the, the way we've set that up is it's actually linked to a uh, computer fingerprint system. So it's based on a number of different factors of your computer. So that way you can't just use a VPN or use alternate emails or something like that to farm fake referrals. Wow, that's a really cool idea. So, so far we've seen a, a number of people start to use that. I'm hoping within the, the next week or two, we'll start to see larger groups starting to use it. So far right now, it's mostly just been a person inviting a single friend or two, but obviously that snowballs over time as those people start to invite their friends. Now, out of curiosity, what is VIP time? So VIP is a status in the game. Basically, it unlocks convenience features. It doesn't make your character any stronger because obviously we, we don't want to be selling all of a sudden you do double damage or anything like that because that would chase away players who aren't able or willing to spend money on the game. But having VIP status on your character allows you to store items in your warehouse regardless of where you are. It'll allow you to teleport to any city just with by clicking a button so you don't have to carry around teleportation scrolls, that sort of things. It'll notify you in chat when a rare item drops from a monster you killed just so that you, you won't necessarily miss it as easily. You'll have the secondary notification. Uh, there's also a few features like you can repair your items from wherever you are. Uh, and we're, we're also adding a few other ones, such as being able to pack items into uh, a scroll so that you free up your inventory space easier. So that way it saves time, it's very convenient and players like it, but that way we're not forced to, to sell any extra power to players. Sure, and, and, and <laughs> this is the type of stuff that, that makes me realize, uh, you know, consistently, the people who are game developers are in the perfect area for cryptocurrencies because a, the demographic is perfect <laughs> for adoption, right? Because everybody who is a gamer has been a member of a community that is decentralized, geographically decentralized, um, and choosing to share a similar common currency, right? And the interesting thing is the stuff that you guys bring into this in terms of what you're talking about convenience, uh, these are things that I think that a lot of cryptocurrencies could learn from. The idea of just making things, you know, pay for a little extra level of convenience. Uh, you know, these are the types of things that are extremely valuable. Out of curiosity, what do you guys see in terms of the gamification of cryptocurrency community rewards? Uh, are there any things that you think that the and I know this is a little bit more of a macro question as a as a uh, opposed to jewel centric but since you are in this field and you're thinking about these things all the time uh, are there any things that you have thought might be beneficial in the blockchain space in terms of distribution mechanisms and um, ways of making it so these currencies are valuable but not unfair uh, you know, for the people who might be spending a little extra money here or there. Uh, any of any thoughts on this? Yeah, so I'm going to answer half of it, and then I'm actually going to pass it over to our other developer, simply because he's already written a very long Steam post on very similar topic. So for myself, sure. one of the most interesting things I find with this is seeing how, in this case, the, the Jules currency sort of takes over the, the game itself a little bit, where you see people who, well, maybe I'm from a country where spending $5 on something really isn't very much. I'm from the States or from Europe or Canada, whereas other countries, that might be a daily wage. So we see these groups forming where someone may drop five, ten, hundred dollars on the game, 
but then they'll build a community out of that where they'll be having someone else where they'll farm a bunch of items or they'll do a bunch of quests and then they'll say well i'll sell you vip if you give me those items and they're they're using jewels to do it but they're they're sort of building a a sub community based on the global economies and how they all connect to each other and from those players perspectives they can play the game they can earn a little bit of uh jewels by selling items to other players or they can earn in-game items and they they can withdraw that to an exchange they can even earn some money so i, I do find that very interesting from a developer standpoint because oftentimes we would have to really crack down on that sort of thing where you have people selling items or characters for cash yeah and that's a bad thing but in the sense of crypto it's not because the, this the crypto is just either way its head. exactly and it it leads to a lot of new ways to think about how things can be done from a design perspective and one of the things i was actually going to bring up later is we are actually working on a jewels auction house so that'll make that a lot easier rather than saying well i'll give you vip that i bought with jewels if you give me a bunch of in-game items you'll be able to say hey here's a bunch of items i've earned you can pay however much jewels you want and it's an auction and then they can sell them on an exchange for real life cash or they can keep them inside the system and that's up to them and and that's one of the things that we're we're really excited to see how players take advantage of unfortunately that is a, about a month or two out we do have quite a lot of work in terms of making sure that's secure and fair to players and that there's no abuse cases but we're we're really excited to see how players adapt to that and the the sub sub systems that pop up surrounding it and on that note yes. i will pass it over to him because that that is one of the things he's working on of and of course that's yeah right okay so uh I'll actually get into a point that you mentioned of uh, uh, how, what Chris was talking about, how players are able to utilize the in-game economy of jewels uh, a little after I go over some other points, but uh, just specifically on the, uh, the jewels side of things, uh, integration into Conquer Heroes was overall pretty successful. Uh, we haven't really had any problems with it so far. We haven't noticed uh, any significant bugs uh, with the system. Uh, players have been making purchases with uh, PayPal and uh, haven't had any problems with that. Uh, since the release of Conquer Heroes, uh, of course, we're interested to see how you know our development affects the market, so we keep an eye on that. Um, it hit about an all-time high of about 2.4x of what our ICO was, which, if I recall the numbers, close to 1850 Satoshis is close to what the ICO finished at. Might be wrong about that, uh, but it should be relatively close to that. Um, just to clarify a point uh, for those who are listening, because we get asked this like at least like every day or two, um, we have been in communications with uh, Bitrex from the very start of the uh, ICO. Uh, we've been emailing back and forth with them, and currently we're still waiting for a follow-up response from them because after the release of Conquer Heroes, we did give them uh, a follow-up uh, informing them of all the changes that we've made, you know, our launch and uh, the status of that. So going back to what Chris was saying, um, in the upcoming uh, you know, weeks, we're going to be starting work on the Jewels Marketplace and the Auction House, and that's going to be an area where players are able to buy and sell items in uh, Conquer Heroes and subsequently any other games that we develop or partner with. So just to point this out, it's really nice that we're able to use Conquer Heroes sort of as a sandbox environment for uh, Rebirth in the future because we're able to test out a lot of our ideas that we wouldn't be able to test without having an actual game, having an actual player base, but we're able to test it uh, on Conquer Heroes and see uh, does this idea work out really well, are there problems with it, and sort of adapt it uh, for our plans in the future. And uh, as I mentioned like uh, on a previous uh, Beyond Bitcoin meeting, uh, eventually these uh, marketplaces and auction houses uh, will be integrated directly with smart contracts, giving users full control of their items and adding the decentralized trading aspect of allowing users to really control their assets. So, going can I ask to, a question real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, th this is the thing for me that's extremely important. Uh, 
and I haven't played yet, so maybe this is something that you guys have completely considered, and probably it is something you've already considered. But for those who do not realize how much goes into thinking about an in-game economy, um, it, it's very deep, and there's a reason why I say that the that gamers are basically the ones who are going to bring crypto to the to the world in a very real way. Um, and it's because they're capable of realizing this stuff. But the question that I want to get to is, um, whenever I'm here and I'm playing, let's imagine that I, you know, I get a certain item and at first it's very rare, right? Um, but as people play more and more and more and more over time, this item becomes less and less valuable because, you know, after I've played this game for three years, I now have two of them. My buddy has one. My other buddy has three of them. You know what I mean? And they don't get rid of them. There's no way of destroying them or anything like that uh, and getting paid jewels for it or anything like that. Uh, or maybe there is. But how do items like that... Uh, how how do, uh, is the quantity the supply of those items managed and how is in how is the incentive work for people to uh maybe break them down for components into other good stuff that they could build or th you know how does that system I find work? it almost amazing that you asked me this question because this was literally the next point that was coming up on like yeah, I almost feel like this is like scripted or yeah. something. Like, holy! Uh, but, no, no, but this uh, this is why a bunch of nerds get together every week to talk about this stuff, man. Because <laughs> that's all we do. You know, this is what we do. Literally, like people in our lives are like, stop doing so much with crypto, and we all come here because we're the only ones who understand. It's like Alcoholics Anonymous for crypto. So going to like what you said. I actually touched upon this in the Steam article I published uh, a couple, or I think it was two weeks ago. Um, so as Chris said, we, you know we're going to be adding items to the Jewels uh, Hero Shop in the days to come. And after the marketplace is released and the auction house is functional, uh, we're going to be starting to look at uh, various monetization models. Uh, for example, one that's used by uh, Spells of Genesis, and you're going to often hear me quote this game like very often because we see it as like. Uh, we see overlaps between what we're trying to do and what they're trying to do. And so there are certain things from their model that we can look at and we can learn from and we can see uh, what's successful and what can be improved upon. So one thing that we uh, really liked about uh, the way uh, their model worked is creating certain items or even cosmetics, for example, that have a basically fixed supply. So going back to your point of what you said, which is uh, I have an item and it degrades over time. That's not necessarily true. And the perfect example I can give of this is uh, if you think about the game RuneScape, there's an item called uh, Party Hats. And Party Hats today are worth a lot more than they were, let's say, three, four years ago. And that's because it was on they were only available one time for one event, and yeah, there was because, never a way to yeah. get them after that event. So there are players who have quit, and the items have just laid dormant. And then since then, you know, the items have shot up in value because obviously gold inflates and it becomes harder and harder to get these items yes. as more people are playing the game. So with fixed supply items that we introduce to the shop, uh, what Spells of Genesis will do very often is they'll create a card and they'll sell it at a certain rate. And people who don't even play the game, they'll purchase the card for using their big crystals for the sole purpose of being able to resell that card to other people on their, uh, you know, their marketplace. And so that's uh, that's an interesting aspect that we want to look at. But more so even going further than that, to uh, point out what Chris said about how uh, people in certain economies are able to leverage jewels in a way that uh, you know is safe for them, uh, we've been discussing ideas back and forth about, uh, for example, let's say there's a player who's a talented artist and they're into 3D modeling or you know they're into texture design. We're open to the idea of, uh, you know, players creating custom textures for us, submitting them to us and saying, hey, you know, I'm willing to pay a small fee if you're willing to feature my texture and, uh, you know, sell it in your shop. And we're willing to then give them, obviously, uh, you know, a cut of the profits from that. So it sort of builds upon a community of editing because for almost every MMO oh, yes. I've ever played, 
I've always seen large communities of people who are willing to make visual mods for games. And the only reason that for companies free. typically ha exactly for free. And the only reason that companies typically have to op uh, oppose this is because they have no way of actually managing the distributed content. So they can't just say, yeah, sure, go ahead, download themselves. or whatever you want. Because if they were to say that, you know, they're basically putting their users at risk of uh, downloading, let's say, something that's potentially malicious. Dangerous, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, <coughs> in terms of further integration into other uh, cryptocurrencies and stuff like that, uh, for example, one of our affiliates from very early on was uh, the C2 coin. And we're looking at the process of being able to deposit uh, various currencies into our system and then be able to receive jewels directly uh, after depositing it into our system. So if you want to think about it, basically think about uh, what Shapeshift essentially does. But the only problem with us directly using Shapeshift cool. is, uh, for one, it limits what coins we're able to... Uh, adopt because uh, we'd have to get them to add it and two jewels is obviously not on shapeshift right now so I've, l I've looked over the system and it's not too overly complex if we do it a little bit of a long way quote quote and that just means the user has to wait a little longer than they would say with shapeshift which is pretty much instant um, they'll, they'll be able to be more flexible about what they put into our system get their jewels and you know begin purchasing things within our shop so they could literally kind of use the system as a bank account for putting in their tokens and then holding jewels in return for Yeah, them. exactly. So the idea is, uh, for example, uh, a user would be able to deposit into our system uh, C2 or let's say even Bitcoin. And then this sort of just simplifies the process of them of obtaining the jewels. So it sort of automates the process of uh, taking that Bitcoin, buying the jewels off the exchange, giving them a rough quote about what they're going to get. But obviously we can't guarantee anything like Shapeshift does because we're not basing this off of a reserve system because we don't want to be holding uh, several reserves of multiple currencies like Shapeshift does. So that's sort of how we envision this working it sort of simplifies things and makes things a lot easier for users that is yeah that really is cool and is the speed dictated uh by the actual coin themselves like also yeah the instance, speed is dictated by a few things which is for one uh obviously you have the speed of jewels you have the speed of the coin of whatever you're doing because we have to make sure a sufficient amount of uh confirmations are uh, received through. before yeah exactly so uh depending on the speed of the coin you know it'll take so long for us to receive the coin move it to an exchange uh obtain the jewels move it back to the user and you know do all that sort of stuff so that's what i say it won't necessarily be as instant as shapeshift but it's a lot easier than having to let's say do all of that yourself manually yeah which if you have a community of people who are playing i can see why that would be something that would be easier for them if it's directly just right there for them so if anyone has uh any questions i haven't been exactly following the chat i'm more than happy to help answer them and so is chris uh yeah i'm looking myself I didn't but see yeah just to go back them. to the point that uh we made earlier I, I i definitely think it's a very powerful feature to allow community-based expansion and allow us to grow with our community and, you know, as we grow in terms of uh, players and potentially, you know, let's say asset designers or texture or, you know, people who create textures and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. um, they're able to benefit from our game monetarily and we're able to benefit from their talent as well. Yeah. And, and I think the, the cool thing is that if you guys are looking at enabling people to create their own uh, items and stuff in game, that's just epic and you could even charge them to make you know special uh series that's just you know a limited series you know to open up certain special uh you know top level top tier tools that they can be using for it one of the things we considered for sorry one of the things we considered for monetization methods was essentially charging a minting fee so the designer would pay a fee to produce a hundred or a thousand or however many tokens they want of that Great specific idea. item. And that way we have our cut from the beginning and it's up to the designer to determine how popular do I think this item is going to be. If they overproduce the supply, and obviously then 
Exactly. And if they overproduce the supply, that's then on them. If they want to produce a million of a token, they're probably not going to be able to sell them all or the price is going to be consistently low. These are the things that, to me, like get me pumped up. Listen, you can probably tell I get excited listening to these little uh, solutions you guys have come up with. But, like, this is yeah, this is the reason why blockchains need to talk to blo- to gaming developers. But yeah, does anybody else have any questions or comments? Okay, well, do you guys have any uh, any way of contacting you if you know somebody wants to work with the project in any way or? Uh, associate yeah. with you guys in some ways, partner up in in some way, you know. So yeah, the, the main email address for that would be admin at jewelsproject.com. Uh, you can also, on our website, we have links to Slack, Twitter, all that sort of thing. That's uh, Jules Project, uh, sorry, jewelsproject.com. Uh, also, I did want to do just a, a quick mention of the gambling games. That is one of the things that are in progress. Uh, for those who haven't been to previous shows, we are developing a series of provably fair gambling games using jewels in the Unity engine. Uh, the purpose of that being is that we can release them for mobile apps, but we can also do them as OpenGL, and we can then embed them into the Heroes game. We can have them as their own website. We can partner with other projects. They can add them to their games. Uh, so we're, we're excited for the, the progress on that and uh, rolling those out to our users and users of other games. Uh, so far, we have hired a statistician to double check all of our map, make sure that everything is uh, checking out on that side. And we've received a number of applications from 3D artists. Uh, we have some of them working on a trial basis right now uh, to produce uh, a couple items. We'll see how they work, and then we'll go from there. And we are still accepting more resumes if you're a 3D artist or a 2D artist or even a Unity developer. We may have work for you, so feel free to send a resume over to admin at jewelsproject.com. Well, th- well, thank you very much. And for anybody who is interested in learning about Unity development, there's plenty of tutorials out there too. It's something that's actually pretty uh, easy access to to get to and learn if you have the time. Uh, so, just an add on there that that I actually am aware of because I'm a nerd and have researched it in the past. But <laughs> thank you guys very much for being transparent about the updates and answering questions and being here for anybody who does have any questions. Um, there are people who have uh, who who are here who seem like they have actually been kind of interested in looking at the game. So you might get some questions from them in the future. And I will say that uh, if anybody wants to play this game with me, I would love to uh, maybe have a night where I'm I don't do any work but play a video game with the community at some point in time in the future. So I'm start I'm gonna start grabbing people who are interested in that. Uh, so just ping me. Yeah, and if you have any questions about the game in specific, uh, rather than emailing us, we recommend you post on our subreddit. So you can uh, get the link for that either in the Mumble, I pasted it, or you can get it directly off our website just by going to community and then to forum. There's already a couple users using it where we've begun discussions about certain things and some users who have reported some bugs or features that aren't working quite as intended. It's also worth mentioning we do have a live support system on our website. If you are having a a sort of immediate issue where you forgot a password or you have a question about the game, uh, definitely let us know through that. That goes directly to our phones, so we we try and have it staffed 24-7, although obviously there can sometimes be a little bit of downtime there. Awesome, guys. Well, thank you very much for showing up today, and as always, thank you for reaching out to people and uh, asking them to support you because you have got you got eight upvotes today, so that means that you reached out to at least a small community of people who know you. And I will urge all people to recognize that uh, reaching out to people in your community and having them upvote will help you in the future. Uh, today at number four with three dollars and fifty nine cents and nine upvotes is Furion. Uh, he would like to talk about the Steam Queue, a decentralized video platform for Steam. Uh, are you here, Furion? Yes, I am here. Can you guys hear me? Perfectly. Um, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, as many of you have seen, uh, Steam Queue has been announced last week, and it has received an amazing response from the community. And uh, 
at that time, this was just an idea, a little prototype. And it seems like it's actually uh, coming to reality. So I've been approached by uh, many really smart people with uh, ideas and suggestions and really hard questions. And the project is starting to take shape in what it's trying to achieve and how is it going to achieve that. So if you look at the original announcement, uh, the core business hypothesis is that there is a need for a decentralized video platform for user-generated content. Uh, that essentially is the content that's similar to how YouTube was in its early days, when people had the ability to just uh, post their homemade videos and have some fun. Yeah. So for, for the first version, uh, what we've decided to do is to base it on top of Steam's blockchain. And the reason for that is because we want this to be um, as, we want to reach as many people as possible for the user base. And if you, if you look at YouTube, it's free and it's open. You don't need anything to watch a YouTube video. You just click on a link and you're right there. And what Steam allows us to do is to have a system where anybody can post for free. And if you make a Steemit account, uh, you get some free tokens, which give you the bandwidth to do any kinds of actions on the website itself. So what this nice. allows us to do is to accept people that are not from the uh, cryptocurrency community. Because if you, if you had to buy some uh, special token, you would first have to buy Bitcoins and then find a way to exchange that and deposit that. And it's, it's just too much of the overhead. Uh, the only way how this model is going to work is if it has the potential to grow and to grow fast. And for that, the traction has to be the minimal possible. So essentially what we need to do is we need to validate the model uh, and to see if it has growth potential. And for us to do that, two things need to happen. One is the churn needs to be lower than the growth. So more people have to join the community and come in and, and enjoy the website than the people that churn out. And if that happens, if that spread is large enough for us to grow, we could potentially build enough momentum to reach into the mainstream. So I'm looking here at all of this and I'm wondering real quick, the, the one big question would be, uh, where are the videos coming from? I mean, where are they going to be hosted? This is a very good question. And uh, we've been looking at different options right now. Uh, the content is uh, stored by IPFS, but that's not the hosting itself. That's just the way to uh, hash the content and prove it's immutable and that it exists and uh, to offer a mechanism for, for discovery um, of which node has the content. But the hosting itself is, is still the question. And the problem here is that video hosting is very, very expensive. Uh, if you imagine the yes, average video... Yes, this is the question, yes. Uh, the average video being, let's say, uh, half a gigabyte in, in size and there's thousands of videos being uploaded every day, uh, who is going to foot the bill? So right now, now, out of curiosity, sorry, I hate to interrupt you, but just a question that I that comes up from this specifically is, uh, w what about torrenting or things like uh, what XBMC does? I mean, there are obviously nodes that that basically do it for free anyway for different other services, uh, or find small ways of monetizing it, perhaps. Um, but have you ever thought about that kind of model or is that not possible? Right, so right now for, for the prototype, uh, we're looking at two models. Uh, one is IPFS, another one is WebTorrent. What uh, WebTorrent would allow us to do is to have people store videos that they watch in their cache and then in the background while they're on the website, re -see them back out. And this would essentially give us uh, free distributed peer-to-peer -peer hosting for all the recent videos. Another model is to have a distributed network of uh, IPFS nodes that host the content for longer periods of time. And uh, these could either be uh, witnesses or we could set up a fund to incentivize people to set up nodes and host the content. Oh. Mm. 
it, it gets even more complex than that because uh, the, the content delivery has to be fast. So yes. when, when you go on a video, you cannot just like wait for a minute for it to start playing. When you click play, <clears throat> it has to start playing right away. And if you want to seek through the video, let's say uh, you just discovered a really long video that's an hour long and you don't know if you like it or not. So you seek through the video, you click on the progress bar on different location and see what it's about. It has to start playing right away. And for us to achieve that, you need to have peers that are geographically nearby you. So the latency is the lowest possible and you get the, the maximum possible bandwidth. And uh, this is a really interesting problem to solve. Now I'm pretty sure- It's a uh, smart network problem, that's for sure. I'm pretty sure there are solutions out there that we can borrow from. Uh, again, it wouldn't be really prudent to try to reinvent the wheel. So we'll be looking at all the possible options, but the idea is to have a distributed uh, system of nodes. And whenever you go on steamq.com, it, it takes your geographic location and it gives you uh, from the cache, it, it serves you the nodes that are nearby you and that might have that content. So the discovery of the nodes is, is much shorter and you get to stream the video right away. Okay, real quick, does anybody have any questions or comments that they would like to uh, like me to bring up to Furon? Because I have so many questions and comments uh, and I, just remember to let me ask you about if whales have helped you out yet. Um, but does anybody have any specific questions? Go ahead and speak up. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Perfectly. It's intelligent. It, it, oh, okay. My, my uh, mic isn't that good and I got a fan running here. So if I'm getting some feedback noise, I apologize. Um, Sounds like honey to the ear, dude. <laughs> reason why um, nobody's ever taken on YouTube and, and I can't say nobody because there's been a few um, video hosting sites but it's not only is it incredibly expensive but uh, um, there's there's much to it as far as storage. I, I'm hearing what he's saying about well we can have nodes that will um, you know seed these files and stuff like that it's different than when you're seeding chunks of a binary file that is static, but when you're getting involved in live streaming, am I cutting out? Right, so to try and answer that question, SteamQ does not do live streaming uh, in its original uh, form. Uh, originally, it's just a video sharing site like YouTube. So you have uh, static videos. Okay, and so how much of the video would you have to download before you'd start watching it? Just. Uh, couple of blobs right at your location where you, where you are in the video right now. You the other thing is, is that I know you receive the whole video. Uh, you just pull down a couple of chunks and it starts playing right away. That, that, that might work out better because it is blobs then. Because I know that a lot of people have a misconception um, for in North America, for instance, that your download speed is equivalent to what your upload speed is, and that's very it's usually wrong. It's your your download speed is like 80% faster than your upload speed, as well as your current bandwidth too for your internet provider. If somebody's uploading a lot and it appears that they're running a server and feeding the net, uh, they have certain uh, restrictions and throttles that can take place. So it's it's going to be very interesting uh, to see how you pull this off. Another question that I have is and and this is the one that's the big one for me is have a lot of whales reached out to you and because this is going to take a lot of money if you're going to even try to do what because IntelliGuy is right there's a lot that goes into this now I'm not an expert in this area but I have spent a good ba a bit of time you know looking at at least the rudimentary stuff um, but I do know enough that it's going to require a lot of resources to to build on to this and try to eventually get to the point where it is streaming. And there are some projects that are out there that utilize various means of accomplishing that. And uh, I mean, a lot of people swear by them. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people really, you know, who, who really enjoy watching streaming content uh, what was it, IntelliGuy? Uh, popcorn time? Is that what you called it? Say that again. Uh, what was the question? I think it's popcorn time. Well, I'm I'm trying to I'm, I'm trying to find out. It was out. me. No, uh, 
Fuzzy, that was a nonlinear one that I mentioned popcorn time because yeah. I, I, I know that, that that actually did work. You know, there's all these projects that may or may not work, but I know that back before it got kind of the boot, it worked. I mean, you could watch movies and they were torrents, but they just screamed and made it so. Do you know how it worked? <laughs> I, I, I don't know all the details. Like the my understanding was that, yeah, my understanding was basically it did the same, or here, you know, my basic understanding, because I never got the time to dig truly into it, but was that it worked basically like a torrent works where you're getting bits down, but the bits were more ordered so that you were getting, you know, yeah, then more of a yeah. sequence so that you could watch it. Um, and so, yeah, and it was, uh, but it was interesting. And it was not surprising that it got shut down because it was based on all these centralized APIs. Um, there's also a, there's also there's also a couple of others that are a different financial model behind them that where you were the the uh, the author of the video wants to get money for the video and you can do that of course with Steam or the Steam type of model but the Steam model is more where it's the user community that decides more or less what you're going to be paying where these other models like Sollywood and I think Jeff Berwick featured one of the video sharing models. Uh, is one where the the author of the video decides what he wants and uh, and gets the money directly that way. I don't know if anybody remembers in 2007 or so there was a place called Zipcast, and they were going to be a YouTube alternative. And they they started to they built the whole interface. They had the back end going, and it worked and it worked well as long as you didn't have too many people use the stuff, uh, which kind of like fails on its face that way. So these type of systems, everybody's saying IPFS, IPFS. Yes, IPFS works great if you have enough nodes on the network serving content. But if you get overloaded by the general user who downloads a client and wants to start watching videos, even the IPFS network can't handle it. That's a very good point, and that's why we're looking for ways to, uh, to do peer-to-peer -peer from the browser as well. Uh, so each user that's using the website uh, gets to see back the videos that they recently watched. To that's okay. Awesome. Ken Code says it can. Go ahead, Ken Code. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just explain, like, in one sentence or less in chat, I guess. Uh, you say that IPFS can handle huge amounts of loads, irregardless of how many nodes are connected, is, is my I guess is what you're trying to get at. Now. So IPFS is, is just a protocol. Um, the actual nodes that host the content uh, still have to be provided by someone. There are many, many ways to, to extract a value and incentivize uh, hosters, but ideally the platform should be such that uh, people don't have to buy a cryptocurrency or pay to watch videos. Uh, so people essentially don't pay for bandwidth. It's free, just like on YouTube. Okay, so here's my question then. Have you been supported by a lot of whales? Are there a lot of people who are stepping up who are reaching out to you and saying hey you know let's uh let's back this you know give us updates and we'll upvote it all yes uh i have been approached by a couple of private investors as well as uh, uh people from uh, well i it's it's in very early stages uh, the talks and uh i don't have enough information to make a decision about this yet so there's there's a little bit of discretion around it and i'll be very excited to bring updates perhaps uh in the next show or two on this topic as we, we are uh, looking to get funded one of the things i found uh, very interesting about your announcement post was some of the user interface enhancements like uh, hiding the amount the dollar amounts uh on videos would you talk about that kind of thing right so the idea is we want to uh, remove uh, as much as human emotion as possible and, and have people enjoy the platform and not it be so much uh, money centered where uh, the, the rewards are in your face. It has to be more, uh, more of a democratic consent where people's votes actually count, not so much the money that, that specific individuals with specific posts make. So you're simply saying that the omission of certain information helps to make the user experience less um, surrounding or less focused on the actual monetary aspect of it. So psychologically, people are going to be far less likely to go out just upvoting things based on the value of it and what they think they're going to make off of it. Right. 
what what I'd like to achieve with this project is is have it be more of a social network and not so much of a money making machine. So if you look at other social networks like uh, let's say Reddit, nobody pays people to be there. Uh, they are there because they want to be and because they enjoy the community and and what they do. And I would like Steam Q to be more of that and less of uh, like constant decision making about what actions will yield a monetary reward and what actions will not. Well, you know, another question, well, first off, does anybody else have questions? <laughs> because you know that I'll do this the entire time if you guys don't have questions. There are plenty of incredibly intelligent people here who have questions, I'm sure. You got a mic, Joey? <laughs> one thing, one. I, yeah. What's what's the revenue model? What's the business model for this? If if the if the platform is set up such that authors of videos can upload their videos for free, basically, and so their costs are minimal, which I understand that model. That's kind of the early YouTube model. And uh, if if that's going to be the model, how will the uh, how how will you make money off this? That is uh, still an open-ended question. Uh, if we are on top of uh, Steam platform, then. Uh, this would kind of depend either on um, Steam It Inc. Uh, owners to uh, donate some of the stake, or perhaps there are other monetization options. Uh, we could have, let's say, a donation model where every day we seek a certain um, amount of rewards, or perhaps we could even integrate it with, uh, with a Steam blockchain itself where people can select a percentage of their rewards that they want to donate to the project. So whenever the, the reward comes in, uh, a small fraction goes to SteamQ and then SteamQ could also use those funds to distribute them to uh, node providers for hosting. And lastly, there is also a promoted post model, which is uh, similar to, uh, to Steamit's, but a little bit different, which would uh, bring in some of the daily revenue as well. Okay, I have to do... I have to do this. Uh, it's going to be a controversial question. I suspect. I probably suspect. Um, why are you choosing to do this on the Steam chain as opposed to forking Steam or cloning Steam um, to be a new chain and doing it directly off of this new chain? Are there is, reasons why you chose to do it on? This is a very good question. Uh, and it's still an open question. It's absolutely a possibility, especially right now. The time is very prime for ICOs. Uh, as you guys have seen uh, the ICO industry lately, uh, you don't actually even need a product anymore. or you need is a really, really good marketing pitch and you can raise thousands of Bitcoins. So it's it's very lucrative to, to just do a fork and a licensing model similar to Golos and, and build uh, our own chain. However, staying on Steam brings a couple of uh, advantages with it for one is that we can push out a product really really fast and validate uh, the market hypothesis and see if we actually have a product market fit or if we require a pivot uh, another op uh, another really good thing is that there is already an existing community uh, that we can tap into and and benefit from so and and lastly um building our own chain uh, adds uh, more uh, time requirements and, and monetary requirements and delays the project and like i said the, the main goal of the project right now is to uh, push out the product and and see if it's actually viable sure so this would be a great testing environment for it regardless and uh, you know this brings me to another question then which is are you familiar with share dropping Yes, yes, I am. So if, if there was an ICO event, a percentage of uh, coins on the new chain uh, would be distributed back to uh, original Steam token holders. See, that was that was uh, uh, the reason why I ask this is because it's a very valuable um, little piece of information for newbies because there's a kind of a culture and it's cool, Furion. Are, are, have you been around in the BTS area for a while? No, actually, I've joined uh, pretty late. I found Steam it uh, a couple of months ago. Okay, well, Steam has brought a lot of people from all over the place, especially in crypto. Um, so it's a lot of people are starting to look at bit shares and what the technology underlying it can do, right? Uh, because of Steam, um, but because of that, you know, there are 
legitimate use cases that as i see it um there there are use cases where we could foresee having an ico because the fact of the matter is at least as i see it and and i'm pretty i pay a lot of attention to this a lot of the highest grossing icos are actually their own blockchains they're not tokens that are on next or bit shares or even ethereum really you know when they have their own blockchains it's almost like the market sees it as a, a a more valuable thing and if that can make more money and it's an innovative chain that's trying to do something cool and it decides that it's going to share drop on steam power holders i think that that makes steam power more valuable uh for people who are actually holding those tokens because then they know that it's almost like you know even though people are going to come out and use the code base and they're going to compete against you know this technology with theirs it's going to start out with like a synergistic um precedent you know where you're saying you know we're giving to a part of this community and then you're also kind of tapping in at the same time and getting some of the benefits of the community that does exist that you're that you're share dropping on so share drop theory has been something that's been alive and well for a long time and it's cool that you know about it already it tells me that you've been talking to people <laughs> uh, but <laughs> with that said does anybody have any questions or and tell a guy saying anyone remembered in war shares yes i do well, that's to, old to add to your point uh it may actually be an absolute necessity for a steam q2 fork uh if the current par paradigm is is not fitting the steam q model for instance if there will be a requirement uh, to incentivize hosting uh, and and do some kind of uh proof of of hosting um and and take rewards from authors and to, to pay from for hosting uh, the this cannot be done on on uh, steam blockchain as of right now uh, another thing would be the, the rewards distribution what if the current uh, distribution model based on votes doesn't work out uh, what if there is a requirement to pivot there as well so yeah there are many really open questions and uh, the goal right now is to to move and to get traction and to figure out what we don't know and uh where we need to change our model yeah it's just really cool that you guys uh well that first off it's cool of you that you acknowledge this because you know a lot of people will they don't want to necessarily say those things and this and this is the honest truth for a lot of people who are in steam and people need to know that especially before they invest into steam power in my in my uh, way of thinking uh, but it's also cool to see that there are people like you out there who see the value in saying you know what if it can't work on this platform even though it can't work on this platform share dropping theory is something that interests you uh, and and I think that that helps create that synergistic relationship because it shows that you acknowledge that wait a second there's an entire community here who's just going to keep growing and thriving if we help them grow and thrive and if that community grows and thrives now anything that i'm working on is going to be benefiting from that if they want to help along the way and utilize some of what they build for steam to maybe uh advertise for what we're doing or create content for what we're doing or you know the, you can tap into that uh, at the same time right because let's face it even though it's a video platform guess what everybody who's on youtube they make their own graphics or pay somebody to make graphics they pay people to write things for them you know there's a lot of use for us for you know side chains too and all of this stuff so uh, it's a very interesting place where we are in the market and i think that there's a huge incentive for people to make clones of steam uh if you guys did you know which might be considered by most people or many people to be the worst case scenario uh, where you have to make your own chain i think it would be a very uh, profitable venture and it would be ve very beneficial that there's somebody who wants to run the project who's understands the share dropping theory and the value of it all right that's a that's a really good point another thing that i forgot to mention however is that 
uh, you know, forking is, is easy. Starting a new thing, it's easy. Uh, but we also have to think about all the benefits that we keep if we don't do that. For instance, um, Steam Queue and Steam It will be just two uh, platforms on top of the Steam's uh, blockchain. But there is more to come. There are a lot of really smart people and entrepreneurs working on this. And uh, there's going to be a marketplace and perhaps an advertising platform um, and, and more other you know, innovative ways to, to do things and solve different problems. And it would be a lot more synergistic for all of the things to be on the same platform and share the same currency. Uh, and, and there is a tremendous amount of power that comes from that as well. Yeah, you're right. It's it's going to be very interesting to see where you where this goes. And what I will say is, if anybody else doesn't have questions, I'll finish off by saying um, that if there are, you know if you need whales to upvote stuff that you guys are doing, like I always recommend people who are doing amazing things uh, provide updates on what they're doing, and you know join these hangouts or you know put the Beyond Bitcoin tag on it, and then just try to reach out to as many people as possible i try to support what i can as a little mini whale and a lot of people who you know uh, are whales or you know dolphins or you know just very well informed people in bit shares uh they they are capable of helping a lot with this stuff too so i i guess what i'm saying is and anybody who's here please consider help fury on out uh, and I know that I will. If you guys can make it easy for us to do that, that would be uh, very helpful. But if you want me to help reach out to whales and stuff too, I'm down for that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for the support. There has been a lot of support from the community and I have been reached by a couple of whales. Uh, and uh, I talked to Ned as well. Uh, if you would like to join the project, you can find me on Steamit Chat. There is also a Steam Queue room on Steamit Chat. We have 35 people already. So if you have any uh, ideas, uh, really hard questions, suggestions for the project, uh, feel free to join and uh, reach out to us. You have now reached the end of part one of the Beyond Bitcoin Hangout for September 30th, 2016. I would like to thank everyone who supported our efforts. Because our Hangouts are starting to get so full with people who need to have their content and their projects covered, we have decided to extend the after party until we reach the point where we have covered all projects that have RSVP'd in the RSVP thread. So if you have RSVP'd and you would like coverage, we will do our best to cover you.